amazing. It's amazing. The Michael Deacon program. 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 Is he embassy? Is he embassy? Is he embassy? Is he embassy? getting some a few more sunny days left i guess the very end of the last gasp of summer uh so uh, it's, it's been quite a uh, quite an interesting season uh we had a very a very uh hot summer season i i i wasn't able to get out uh, into the countryside uh, as much this year uh, uh-huh. but i uh, still I, I got as much outdoors time as, as i can as i could and what's the weather there right now well we are a uh, a cool 58 degrees fahrenheit Ooh. With overcast skies and I, just sort of a, a more persistent cooling now. Like uh, now that we're not being so sun baked, the, the the sun has descended towards the south, and so uh, we're getting the more indirect rays, and thereby the uh, the land isn't hot. And when you're out on the sidewalk in the morning, you, you don't you're feeling the, the persistent cold throughout. So uh, eventually, it's because we're in a very uh, we're a seaport, we're a very uh, uh, hum- high humidity environment. That that sort of adds up to what our our, our winters like we have a lot of rain a lot of condensation we may get some snow and some freezing temperatures but mostly it's just a very uh sort of formidably dark time of year with a lot of a lot of rain <laughs> ah so in other words very much like seattle uh, very seattle yes it's a temperate rain forest so we expect a lot of humidity a lot of condensation uh, and that's that's part of the experience living in this more northerly uh, and uh, mountain coastal space Currently, right now, it is 73 degrees where I am. You're the ocean. Well, yes, and so you're, 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 uh, you're enjoying much warmer temperatures and much later in the year than we will. We're much more of a four-season type of space, although we don't have the more, we have the least severe uh, winters of all of Canada. Right. We're basically safe, unlike the majority of the East Coast and uh, the folks in Florida, in other words. Well, yes, and so uh, we were watching uh, just at the, the uh, tremendous... Uh, forces involved in the in the storms coming off the gulf of mexico and crossing florida and and the the eastern seaboard of the united states that so many communities have been uh, uh turned turn to chaos yeah. due, due to na- nature's uh forces and it, it's inspired a tremendous uh amount of energy in this conspiracy community as well there's many people voicing the, a variety of claims uh, uh, to to the point now that I understand even the American meteorologists are, are facing death threats. Are you are you serious? I didn't even know that they're actually facing death threats. This is the latest phase of the uh, wow the, the the foment, so to speak, of of the uh, of the comp- the public complaints uh, and and the the various theories that are are gathering interest uh, in the particularly in you know in the yeah. online. Uh, space, uh, but these are so influential that the, the the federal government is responding to them in their press briefings and so on. And in fact, they're citing the the, the role of conspiracy theory in changing the, the uh, survivor responses to uh, to uh, first responder emergency response teams. But they don't want to take government assistance because they're afraid that they're going to be signing away their land or some other kind of. Uh, you know, persistent theory that's out there. So there's a lot of a lot of suspicious uh, Very. minds uh, work, working together. There, there's a numerous threads. Uh, there's there's, there's a, a, a major stake of lithium in North Carolina near um, near Asheville uh, that's being persistently cited as uh, they're wanting to deep depeople the region for for industry. 
purposes. Uh, there's uh, and these 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 conspiracies link link all the way up, to, I think, to the, uh, the the husband of Vice President Harris. Apparently, is yes, is playing a role in some of this as well. Furthermore, people su suspect the role of uh, high-powered uh, electromagnetic uh, emitters throughout the, the United States, uh, their role in influencing uh, the direction, the tracks of storm. And there's a, there's there's videos on YouTube uh, showing su supposedly showing trans transmitter stations throughout uh, a, 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 a number of U.S. states and their activity during the track of a storm, the Hurricane Helene, and how uh, people people were amazed that you know it transversed uh, the the seaboard inland and had you know the impact was far far north into North Carolina North Carolina than. Uh, Maybe most people would expect, and those those traditional communities were overturned in many. There were thirty foot tsunamis uh, hitting some of those places. Absolutely, it was very unusual weather, that's for sure. Even though most of the residents already know that reside in Florida, they're very much aware that they have this sort of insane kind of weather, and we've been seeing it for a very long time. But yes, a lot of people did not believe what they were experiencing was organic in any nature. Yeah, and so there's, this is this is part of the culture when we're speaking today. This is the the atmosphere into which we're speaking that people are still questioning, and they're questioning these questions. These questions are being asked in very energized ways, and some people are being inspired to action. Apparently, uh, it's quite a foment. It uh, is. It's, it's an interesting time, I would say. Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, these are very high energy events, and they can spark uh, society in different directions uh, depending on you know depending on outcomes. Yeah. So. I observe observers watch will watch closely as as uh, you know we, when I was watching the the videos of the of the people who wanted to, were evacuating the Tampa Bay area could see that the the early evacuees were going to get, be able to get out in reasonable time and, and that their vehicles would be less exposed whereas late evacuees on those long causeways and bridges and overwater bridge, bridges and such uh, the level of exposure and risk of exposure to this to being in, caught in the storm was very high. You know, some some folks who I know in in Florida said that they would have been safer staying in their home than they were out on the road. That the road was dangerous uh, during Helene, and so uh, it was. Uh, you know, this is what it, this is what it looks like when when Americans flee the major urban centers. Oh yes, this is what it, we could, if if this was being repeated in another major center, we could expect the same types of images of uh, lineups on the highways. Uh, oh yes, at, em empty store shelves. I strongly uh, agree with you, John. And this is a precursor of what could come if, a, let's say, an EMP just uh, happened to uh, go off. Um, this sort of reaction is basically what we would see, but in mass, in mass response, not just uh, there in Florida. Uh, as you said, empty shelves and the streets being as dangerous as they they can be, uh, I I would suspect that something like that would in fact uh, occur in America. Yes, it seems it seems that the population is is energized in these events. Uh, there's uh, there, there's there's high high powered dynamics playing out you know, between the population and the government in, in these in these spaces and the the rhetoric the charged rhetoric that comes from the the people who are suffering or or witnessing the suffering is, you know, is is indicative. There's uh there's there's serious challenges oh, yeah. that, yeah, like a crisis will uh, sh show the we the weak strengths and weaknesses of the people who try to put out the fire. So, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of raw situations being exposed through this. Oh, I yes. hope there's I hope there's much better outcomes for, for the communities. But my respects for the long lived people in those communities. Uh, and the devastation that they uh, that they're facing now, the the lively the way way the way of life has been deeply impacted. My goodness, I hate for something like that to happen on a mass level. But this was a good way to sort of measure the waters, uh, no pun intended, in terms of what can can happen for those that are unprepared and unprepared, unwilling to prepare, perhaps. Yeah, let, let know, that be an example for everyone that you should be prepared in case something like this uh, occurs in your town. Well, the Boy Scouts said be prepared. I mean, uh, it's it's a very it's very it's very traditional <laughs> <It> idea. <is. laughs> well, and so so li modern living, uh, you know, these considerations are becoming they're becoming more trendy and more publicly open. If we recall the reports of uh, uh, nuclear attack instructions in public uh, billboards in New York City. That have that had arisen in the past several years, uh, in in case of attack, do this. Oh yes, 
uh, this you know this the normalization of 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 the state at war. This culture is uh, is 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 amplifying. It's this has been my my commentary over the last ten years or so about this this tr this trending towards the the security state. We have a we already have like a secu a high security oriented culture in so much as we're actively censoring uh, topics in online uh, discourse. Yeah. As as of today, I read that on Reddit, it's now forbidden to talk about the assassination attempts against one former U.S. president, and I'm not, not talking about Lincoln. Really? Yes. This is this is the latest. Wow. Uh, in this in now this thread. <laughs> yeah. So the, this so we see that uh, maybe you know some f f relatively free, freedom oriented forum, forums people could rely on in the past. Those the past is over, and we're rapidly transitioning towards this high high censorship uh, society. And many, you know, it's deeply it's deeply embedded in in the major social platforms that people are familiar with. But it's becoming more and more prevalent. And furthermore, the uh, some the, the more the more uh, rogue uh, hosting sites are, are now uh, changing their tunes in different countries where they've been facing uh, lawsuits by the government. Uh, they are uh, they're, they're they're doing compliance to uh, to effectively censor uh, users' uh, freedoms of activity on the site or freedom of expression. When the, especially you know sites sites are like uh, Twitter X are cited in the, in this type of activity. And uh, there was I think there was another web uh, Canadian owned uh, uh, social media that was. Uh, that they also they also negotiate with the European government over oh, yes. over these types of charges, and so we see that that the uh, even even the alternative sites, so to speak, are transitioning over to becoming further agents of government these type of government censorship agendas. It's it's just sort of it's inescapable a trend, but it's coloring our uh, coloring the qualitative nature, uh, qualitative and quantity of good good qu culture that that's possible to foment in a high highly censorious environment. Well, that's my complaint about it. <laughs> Speaking of which, in the UK, people have been arrested for social media comments deemed offensive or harmful under various laws. And uh, I guess one example would be back in 2022 that involved a woman being arrested for posting uh, memes online. Well, another yes. person was arrested after posting uh, song lyrics online. I, I mean, it's kind of wild. And my country, they're pretty much flirting with that idea right now wanting this sort of a thing to actually happen well it is actually happening as as you speak of it now it, that the uk has uh, moved over to this new phase of society where uh, uh, online speech is now highly uh, well it's highly surveillance and there are there are laws uh, that are being new laws that are being uh, enforced against uh, this this is, this is a very controversial situation but it t it speaks about what's coming downstream uh, other Closely related countries like Canada, which are you know former British Empire properties, may had, may be uh, anticipating, or Australia may be anticipating adopting uh, the, these these kinds of new laws and and go to govern and police uh, social media freedom of speech uh, op openly and publicly, and to prosecute participants in those uh, d discourses. So it's it's quite uh, antagonistic, you know, to f uh, freedom of expression or freedom of assembly. But this is a long, it's a long developing trend uh, it, that is in part uh, been birthed by the, by the mutual in, endeavors of corporations and agencies, you know, to produce the kind of social media we have today. It's a marriage of those partnerships that's producing the outcomes, you know, what the, what the user experience has right. become. But don't you think that's dangerous to flirt with that idea, to dictate what can and can be said and what it can imply? It's like, uh, do we even trust the people that are even trying to make this into law? Well, I, I, in some ways, I am suspicious that it, it's perhaps just more revelatory of perhaps the behind the scenes what the culture has really been like in a in a freedom loving, openly freedom loving culture. We, behind the scenes, we're perhaps highly controlling. Right. I need to cough. I need to cough here. Okay, it's okay. Definitely cough, but yes, there's been much discussion on what exactly counts as a quote-unquote conspiracy theory and about what, if anything, is wrong with those who hold one. Well, exactly. And so this is very Orwellian and very futuristic, except it's happening now. And it's, it's, incubating, it's incubating a type of cultural experiment or a social experiment to see what the outcomes are. And this is the, I guess this is the select population that's going to be, it's going to be conducted on. I think it's quite radical 
and perhaps perhaps extreme. Uh, well, I would say it is extreme. As a, as a you know freedom of expression activist, you know for a long time, I think that uh, it is extreme because I think it's going to um, well, it's going to uh, st it's going to stunt the development of intellect. How about that? I agree. A hundred percent. A good example, by the way, would be that the CIA was responsible for the assassination of JFK and that doctors de deliberately manufactured the AIDS virus. Well, and so, <laughs> you know, there, there, there are there are there are, uh, there, there are a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of unsolved questions in our in our society. Correct. And maybe in our lifetime, some of them we will be able to penetrate those mysteries. But it's. I, I suspect that you know, in my lifetime, I, I will not be able to breach every every nook and cranny. Nook and cranny, of, uh, right? You know, our history. You know, history. Whether you know whether it has you know, it's just like the moon. It's uh, you know, has a dark side and a bright side, and it, it phases in different stages. Uh, you know, it's I, I guess it's part, those gyrations are part of what makes you know what makes things alive. Uh, and so uh, I think it's rather you know how successful we navigate the portions that we can access and how much. Sort of pe penetrating and transposable knowledge we can uh, we can gather, you know, through through our through through attempting to encounter and solve some of these problems. I think, uh, in other words, I'm sort of say, talk, saying you can sometimes mm -hmm. realize the universe in the grain of sand. I like that, and of course, some conspiracy theories under definition have turned out to be somewhat true. I mean, just look at Watergate, uh, for instance, the Watergate hotel room used by the uh, Democratic National Committee was in fact bugged by the Republican officials. And of course, we all know what went on in the 1950s with our friends, the CIA, when they administered LSD and uh, other related uh, drugs under the Project, project uh, MKUltra. Yes, and, and these revelations started to become public through the church committee hearings in 1975 and 76. And so uh, when the public became, it was quite shocking and revelatory in, in its day. But that did not stem that flow in our society as as you know black operations you know Iran Contra colored the 1980s in the Reagan era. Uh, this this kind of uh, black ops culture was was something that was uh, stronger and more virile than uh, than even than even public exposure could change. I mean people say people say that the programs remained and they they just came under new names. I mean, in many cases, I I speculate uh, from the, you know as an outsider in any of this, but Canada played a significant role in the uh, MK Ultra program. Uh, uh, numerous experiments were carried out through McGill University in Montreal, uh, Quebec, and uh, it, it was it's even it's been written about in the in the McGill student paper. They called it MK Ultra torture, I believe is the oh title my. of the article. So that's a nice yeah, name. It's part of it's part of our Canadian legacy, and I've I've read over over the years as I've I had written about this at, at some or reported on this at some at some time um, that uh, over the years uh, people have talked about family members here in the in the Fraser Valley who had been uh, who had been mm -hmm. witting or unwitting experiments in in in, in those programs, but at, 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 as I say outside of McGill in other like local and regional he mental health wards. It also they drawn experimental data, uh, you know, from all of these sources. So uh, there was there's there's a legacy of families who were affected here in the Lower Mainland as well as other parts of Canada, and it's uh, it, it's a sad and shameful thing when we think about how many Canadians died in World War II fighting uh, against uh, a, 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 a sadistic culture, but we're still fomenting that here. Uh, you know, we've turned our resources in part have been turned. You know, we, we're still we're still torturing people in different ways. It's really uh, it's it, it it's really troubles people's. I think it troubles the conscience of the nation in different ways, and it manifests in our culture. You know how how we um, how we how we how we de how we talk about violence issues in violence in in, in public forums, in part. You know how it, it gives manifestations to deep uh, deep psychic urges within the the uh, the larger social body due to living in a in a culture. You know that. That solves so many problems, but at the same time starts a lot of wars. <laughs> right, and as you mentioned in your lifetime, you may not get all the answers you seeked out for, and I feel pretty much the same way uh, sitting here and talking to you. And by going back in the past and talking about some of the things that we just highlighted here, it makes me wonder what what juicy sort of conspiracies will play out and be talked about on a larger scale. In let's say ten, twenty years from now, well, time is the great test, I think, and so uh, some 
some truths will take longer to come to uh, you know to, be, to public acceptance or public awareness than others perhaps so some people will their work will be recognized at posthumously and some people uh, perhaps sooner uh, it's, i think it's very interesting as we're such a a communicative culture and, and, and many books uh, you know authors like david ike publish voluminous materials and and, and media uh, to discuss their their interpretations of events. And so there's a lot of food for thought that people consider when we look back. What what, what people thought was uh, was a sure thing in 2002, you know, may not be so sure in 2052. And in turn, oh my goodness, the cat is uh, ripping things to shred in the room now. Oh, wow, this is a wild, a wild cat that you have here. Are you sure this isn't a bobcat? <laughs> He's uh, a black cat. He looks uh, like a small panther. A panther. Well, yes. You know, I've, I've I've met many friendly black cats in my time. I, I, uh, you know, I, I uh, refute the superstition about black cats bringing any sort of bad luck whatsoever. I agree with you 100. percent And I've never owned a black cat, and I had no idea that their personalities would be as uh, nice as this guy's personality. He's <laughs> extremely friendly and uh, extremely curious, uh, and he basically gets into everything if you leave it out in the open. Well, that, I, I think it's a great thing, and uh, I, I had I've had uh, you know ex lots of exposure to cats in the past, and I, and I even had a when I was a, a young person, uh, a, a neighbor's cat was was very close to me, and I was uh, always after school the cat would come over, and I would go outside and play with the cat, and it was always a that was a your thing. cat but, now, by the way. Well, <laughs> it, 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 for that time, yes, it was. I got to play with the, my neighbor's cat, and so the, but the cat was always was super engaged with 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 visiting and uh so i i got that the great benefit you know of having a, a, an animal they say that the cat is the closest thing to a wild animal that will that will hang out with a human oh i love that yes uh, there's something extraordinary about these cats uh, probably why the egyptians loved them so much and worshiped them they knew something that we didn't it was a, this goes back to the very long history of of cats and dogs in in their interactions with humans and my my last reading of this was that they there was a there was some sort of mutual reason to coexist together that was an improvement over living wild and separate that they, that everyone entered some sort of an agreement at some point i think and in some ways in my imagination i feel as if the animals look to the humans to do our part so that they can have good lives you know like if they if they're born as pet animals then they're, they're you know they're looking to the human to, to do their part to make sure they have a good pet experience that too yes and of course they are the only animal that mimicked the sound of a crying baby <laughs> and it yeah. stayed in their dna for our, how many for since the beginning of time it seems like uh, no other animal has uh, ever done that so yes they're quite extraordinary yes yeah, certainly i i give them a lot of uh, respect very uh, no, noble and uh, at their you know at their best and uh i think you know people can learn if uh, some people have a very natural way with animals you know some people are in an animal husbandry or care or veterinary uh who has also a sort of a natural touch with uh with creatures and um i think there's a, you know there's such a long there's just such a long history between human and animal like the human and the horse was a big innovation you know, that changed societies the the, the the joining of the part or the partnership, the life partnership of the animal and the human changed civilization in many ways. Since we're kind of on this topic here, you know, we're, we're talking about animals. We talked about LSD and the name John and Lily popped into my mind as well with his experiments <laughs> in an isolation tank and administering LSD in the, the I, dolphin's tank. The, was that, I read his book, which I believe was The Eye of the Cyclone, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you're correct, yes. Well, so I read his book uh, with interest when I was, you know, in college years, uh, very uh, mind expanding. And, and of course, I, as a younger person, I had seen the George C. Scott uh, Dolphins film that was made uh, about about you know, the, the fictional version, I guess, about his mm -hmm. research or his or his uh, how to say it, uh, how his research appeared in, in the most publicly visible way as a, you know, as a theme in a film. Well, and so it was, uh, yes, it was very mind opening. And I, I did recall, I, I, I affectionately uh, read, th read that book and I kept it with me. It uh, was not a difficult read, but the man was very intelligent and also innovative. Uh, uh, I think he was also a controversial personality in some ways for his time. But um, nevertheless, uh, he inspired, you know, he inspired uh, 
he inspired the culture to think differently about human animal interactions. And I remember that it was a big deal uh, that that film in the 1970s, you know, scientists and the dolphins t talking <laughs> I, with George C. Scott. I remember that was the, the day of the dolphin. That was what it was called. That film was a big deal in its time. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I, I got to ask you this question here, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But have you ever uh, taken LSD yourself? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. I think you're missing out. I mean, I I didn't take acid until much later on in life. To uh, be honest, within maybe the last three years is the uh, the first time I've ever administered it myself. And I got to be honest with you, John, I enjoyed my experience uh, quite heavily. Well, you you may be interested to know that there's a very open culture around that in the city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Ah, in, okay. in fact, there's retail storefronts where people can go in and buy psychedelic mushrooms mm. and dmt and peyote it's just i think i'm not ready for a dmt i don't think i want to really go into the spirit world I, salvia I think, divinorum yeah that's a little <laughs> it's a little too much for me i, I think i'm just fine with the acid uh, to be completely honest with you well the, the, so, so i say that vancouver British Columbia historically is is a psychedelics um research center as part of the culture here i see it's so open that even even without proper licensing that people are running retail storefronts in the city oh, and yes. i guess they're appeal they're, they're appealing to a lot of perhaps tourists as well as uh local consumers uh and the police are not are not help you know they have other things to do so the, the, it perhaps uh, you know back in the back in the pre-legalization of cannabis era oh yes uh, that reminds yeah the city of Vancouver had over a hundred storefronts, all operating mm -hmm. illegally and without heavy, you know, without a heavily police, uh, you know, pressure. Uh, that went on in, for years, uh, and so again, it was characteristic of the city to to uh, to have that as part of the the, the experience, uh, the cultural experience. And yeah. now, you know, it's uh, so as I say that it's very accessible here. And it's also it's historically it's been a, it was very it's a very influential idea the notion of the, the role of the psychedelic or this the psychotropic uh, plant. Mm -hmm, I agree, and uh, yes, uh, Vancouver very infamous with uh, cannabis culture, and I believe the magazine Cannabis Culture actually came from Vancouver, and you had uh, Mark Emery, I believe, who owned a seed bank company, and he got into hot water, and they extradited him here to America and charged him for that. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Mark Emery. Yes, I am, and and cannabis culture still opens, still runs a retail storefront in the city of Vancouver. In fact, but uh, Mark Emery's history included incarceration in Washington State over um, seed selling charges, and uh, they they were controversial in in so much as the U.S. exercised uh, police jurisdiction within the city of Vancouver to undertake the arrest with the aid of the federal and city police in Vancouver. But they, it was extrajudicial. They don't have any U.S. police. Don't by any law stand legal standing have any kind of standing to be up here running operations inside the borders of Canada. Nevertheless, this is all ancient history. Now he served time in the United States, and then he was returned to Canada. And it was a major. Uh, it was a, a very popular story in the state media. Mark Emery's wife was very outspoken, Jody Emery, and she was a regular guest on broadcasters like the Canada Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, and the Canada Television Network, CTV, the regular guest on these shows on and on and on because of the media's media's love for the sort of the flagrant uh, subversiveness of cannabis in, in that time when it was on the edge of legalization. As I say, it was so flagrant. There was over 100 storefronts here operating. Man, that's so, wild. Yeah, in that in that sense. At the same time, this is a very normal and uh, normal you know, now. Yeah, at the time, I remember going back to about two thousand three to about two thousand five. I was uh, heavily invested in seeing what was going on in Vancouver and seeing the cannabis laws uh, slowly change here in America. And I believe that was an influence uh, by our friends up north, the Great White well, North. Well, in part, I understand that Mark Emery was directly funding uh, normal and other. Uh, uh, movements in the United States, and in fact, that was cited as he, you know, that I believe he or his family felt that he was being prosecuted due to his the influence of his cash injections into those movements for uh, legal federal legalization. Right. 
So that this was a, it was a very conspiracy, very much a conspiracy. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I mean, the crit critics of of drug enforcement, federal drug enforcement in the United States, say the uh, the you know DEA say that uh, they made an industry out of out of their profession, <laughs> and, and so it's you know it's become very lucrative. Uh, to, to keep oh, things yes. as they are or worse, um, uh, you know, the, and so people find that very stagnant when they, when the, crit, the critics, when they look at this, uh, I, I can't say, I, I have no insider perspective on what's going on there, but I, I although I, I think, I, yes, I have met at least one D, for, former DEA agent and he was a formidable individual. I met him at a UFO Skywatch, as oh, a matter of fact. Interesting. But, so, but, but nevertheless, uh, people complain about bureaucracy or the, you know, the, you know, you know, they used to be. Uh, you know, the people complained about the the, the communists uh, and the, the communists because <laughs> the great the major bureaucrats. But we can see clearly, you know, what, what a bureaucracy our society has now. Absolutely, and of course, we're talking to Mr. John Kelly, an international clinician and world famous speech analyst. Of course, that's yourinnervoice dot com, and you could call him toll free one. 888-453-0751. And I even remember that number, John. Are you impressed? I, I, I feel like I'm really getting the red carpet this, on this <laughs> show. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I tried. You know, I wanted to make it a, I had to make it a little bit more professional here for you since uh, you're here on the program. Got to give it my all. And uh, yes, John, tell us a little bit about yourself, my friend, and how you got involved in speech analysis. Well, so my, my practice became well known over, over time. But I was interested in audio studies. I, I had a, a significant amount of training as a music student, as a teenager, adolescent, and so on. Uh, a lot of exposure to to educational opportunities and, and study and practice. And so, in my as a young adult, I continued my my interest in music studies and you know American jazz music and saxophone performance and transcribing performances and the, into notation and using different kinds of audio technology. I used to have a uh, a cassette deck player with a multi-speed cassette player uh, deck. So uh, I, I would I started with that to do j jazz transcriptions. You know, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Charlie Parker, to learn that music. It was my great interest as a youth, and I, I felt deeply attached to the culture. So technology allowed me to answer what I thought to me, it, you know, it was great music. And um, so I continued, you know, I continued to embrace that, and, and I, I became a computer owner in the early 1990s. And uh, I became aware of audio, uh, audio editing and production software uh, in the early 90s. And uh, software called Cool Edit, was, which eventually became an Adobe product, uh, Adobe Audition. And you used um, Winamp, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I, th I saw Winamp, but I, did, I, I, did, I, did, I really started with Cool Edit uh, in, in the early 90s. And I, that was because it was a, because of the um, scope of the of the the, mm -hmm. to, the tools that they provided, I felt and and I felt that I was in a you know a uh, a quality environment. And so, I, in other words, I never felt attracted to to the switch apps. Although I, I know that a lot, that people like uh, free audio editing apps, and I, I'm aware of that as well. Uh, uh, I, I I've investigated some of that as well, but I I, I always. As someone who worked at one time in the tech industry, I my perspective was that if if you have a product and you have support that goes with the product, then you know you, you if you have to pay something to get that, then at least you have something that's going to you know guaranteed to operate you know to continue to work and all. Uh, so I, I I'm a little bit of a believer in you know uh, at least that was but you know the sidetrack is that was in the day before most of the software became available only as a software as a service where people have to buy a subscription now. To get uh, Adobe Audition, oh, I, 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 I bought a licensed standalone version in the early 2000s, and I still it still works. So wow, I, I, really? I, so yeah, so I, I I retained my my investment in nice. my standalone software. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. You know, <laughs> I use have, I use yeah. Adobe Audition myself, but it's you know, it's from uh, it fell off a truck, um, John. If you know what I mean. Well, there it 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 missed. You know, it, it, I I. Uh, well, at one time, I couldn't get my version to work, and so I downloaded the free trial of of a recent iteration. And my my observation was, uh, other than a few interface tweaks, what was obvious to me, it looked like Cool Edit Pro from the early two thousands, right? Like, yeah, I mean, they didn't necessarily invest invest a lot of transformational things that weren't already that I didn't already have in my two thousand and seven version. 
right? And so, yeah, the, 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 there were a lot of user complaints about that. I'm, I'm I, for my production purposes, it's been fine. I'm certainly, but I don't, you know, it's not avid. So I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just been an effect, effective enough. And so, in so much as I'm only using so many of the tools, I mean, a limited set of the tools, to be honest. I mean, I'm using the time compression expansion and the reverse functions in in that software. Oh yes, the standard tools. Yeah, just just you know, okay. sim, sim, simple editing. Uh, but because of the uh, because of the speed of production that it provides, uh, I can do I can do relatively uh, I can work effectively in that environment for the scale of production or, or scope of production that I'm normally expected to achieve. But I've never had to do I've never had to produce tracks on demand for like a an episodic television show oh, or something okay. like that. I see. You know, I, so I think that I, in a different in a in a more sophisticated production environment, people may have preferences that I don't know about, but I, I, my, my simple read is that I'm, the audio quality that I'm producing is, at least for speech, is sufficient, and uh, I'm still learning music production. <laughs> no worries, yes. There's lots of uh, programs out there, free and ones you have to pay a subscription for, but to be honest with you, I've always just liked Adobe Audition. Oh, I see. So you, you are a fan. Well, there oh, you go. Oh, of course, yes. I still use it quite heavily, for sure. Cool Edit was one of the number one. I remember. Soft, oh yeah, the, the the number one choices for morning radio shows uh, 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 for for producers that I talked to. Everyone, uh, you know, a huge number of them were on Cool Edit. So there was a there was a lot of preference amongst pros back in the '90s for that uh, software, and I, it just seemed so solidly. At least, it, you know, it was the development was was to meet those, you know, meet at least morning radio standards. So. Uh, I had a lot of confidence in it as a tool, but I have I respect this you know whole schools of thought uh, and other you know industry tools uh, you know that you you know there's I I didn't I I I, uh, I, I it was it, I was never called upon to you know to be like on a cinematic score or something like that to to have to produce to those standards. So, anyway, so I guess I guess if I I'll reach that bridge. I'll be able to cross it, but on my own by my own means. And you know, to my own level of interest, at least I was able to efficiently master Cool Edit to be able to produce regular uh, radio content, fresh radio content on a regular basis. That that the the quality of the production, the fidelity was was high enough. It was good enough for broadcast. And that's all that really matters, in my opinion. As long as you get it ready for a a broadcast, a for a radio station, what have you, it's good to go. No no point in changing that. But uh, today you have uh, some audio. Uh, for yeah. us, uh, John, I'm ready to get into that. But you know, before we do, I actually found uh, one of these uh, New York sort of uh, P, uh, one of these uh, public service announcements. Actually, uh, this is the very famous one, uh, John. I'm sure you heard it. So there's been a nuclear attack. Don't ask me how or why. Just know that the big one has hit. Okay, so. What do we do? There are three important steps that I want you to remember. Step one, get inside fast. You, your friends, your family, get inside. And no, staying in the car is not an option. You need to get into a building and move away from the windows. Step two, stay inside. Shut all doors and windows. Have a basement? Head there. If you don't have one, get as far into the middle of the building as possible. If you were outside after the blast, get clean immediately. Remove and bag all outer clothing to keep radioactive dust or ash away from your body. Step three, stay tuned. Follow media for more information. Don't forget to sign up for Notify NYC for official alerts and updates. And don't go outside until officials say it's safe. All right, you've got this. My goodness, that's uh, quite the announcement to make. I feel better already. <laughs> yes. Well, and so this is the normalization of, of a potential disaster. Uh, in, in some ways, responsible government helps the, the public to prepare for possible outcomes, foreseeable outcomes. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of shocking to people's perhaps people's perception of security of the homeland that uh, for uh, perhaps uh, of, of some uh, some number of generations, there was great security 
in 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 the isolation uh, the the oceanic isolation of of both coasts of the united states from U european conflict and asian conflict and now uh now there's there's no uh, there is there's no easy uh, there's less there's less there's less ease now i think in the minds of many that the, the uh, when it comes to this idea that the pr conflict the proximity of conflict is much closer to home right exactly but would you trust the word of the government especially after what we saw and how they treated those people that experienced what they did in north carolina and now in florida and how fema really just dropped the ball I understand these bitter <laughs> complaints, and and I and I seen the protests of aid givers who were cast out or bar, yeah. barred access and all, and uh, I I think there's a lot of uh, questions to be answered about about what what's the real deal and if there's uh, corruption that's at the root of why why the response you know appears lackluster. I understand there's military on site in in North Carolina at this time, so there's military level response. But uh, I, I'm I, I'm not the be from a distance. I'm not a great auditor of performance. But I, I loud and clear, I recognize uh, there's some serious complaints. Uh, not not everything is just a uh, you know some kind of uh, troll trolling on the hot issues. But right. But rather there are some there's serious cause for concern. And I, and I uh, again I would not I, I having been in a. a a small canyon uh, up here in BC. I spent time in a in an off grid cabin in that canyon. I I could understand how if there were flood conditions, how dangerous it would be. Ooh, yeah, to be, to, especially to be in the canyon. Mm -hmm. How you know limited limited routes for escape and all. And in fact, uh, that just you know to highlight my 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 good friend's uh, UFO canyon cabin. In fact, was caught in a fire in that canyon, and they lost. That lost the ca the the cabin over a fire disaster. So, yeah, it, it, he he was able to get, he was able to avoid uh, injury at that time. But the uh, again the, the uh, these enclosed uh, chimney rock type communities, the limited access and egress, and uh, and so uh, much. Uh, m much more, much I guess I guess some you know these nat natural events can be much more felt intensely upon those communities, and uh, I I don't know what to say more than it's I think it's it's absolutely a disaster. There's still millions of people without power in Florida. Uh, the forecast for, and worst case was that wide swaths of of uh, of you know urban space would be uninhabitable for long periods of time, due to power failures. So you can't operate proper sewage or. Uh, other, you know, heat, cold, cooling, whatever's necessary, cooking, et cetera. It's not safe. Uh, so these are huge economic disasters uh, for those, for these areas, for the businesses that it can't operate and the people can't go to their jobs. It's a huge, huge economic disaster. We still need to, uh, a lot, it's going to take a lot of time, I think, uh, you know, the next three to six months before we see where perhaps where all of these, all the, the healing can uh, be completed. And, and, and yet, this hurricane season is only just underway, and the forecasts say that to expect that there's still more storms. So, uh, I, I I don't like seeing uh, so much uh, difficulty uh, on such a mass scale, and uh, it was very upsetting to me when I thought about my friend uh, outside of Tallahassee, uh, who fortunately the, the Helene missed by traveling east, <laughs> but he told me this hair-raising tale about. At the last minute, finally deciding to abandon when it was categorized Cat Five, and the cat forecast was this building would, wouldn't survive. So, my oh my, I can't even imagine John being in uh, being caught up in any of that. Imagine making decisions like that and being Oof. put in a position where you have, you're being called upon, and you got animals to care for and what whatnot. And so he said that he had a hair raising journey on the highway heading uh, west, and uh, wow. got, almost almost getting blown off the road. This and that. Uh, uh, and also, also just being on the road with other sort of uh, uh, hor uh, terrified drivers who may not function, who may not be functioning very yeah. well as uh, they're as drivers of vehicles when they're in that emotional state. So people having a lot of, you know, lots of different challenges being out on the road and the risk of exposure and all. Uh, nevertheless, uh, he came through in good health and his animals survived, and his house, uh, as he said, fortunately for him. His nice rural uh, setting outside of Tallahassee. He, he, he suffered very. There was very limited. One tree down on the property is what he said. Uh, but we know uh, just from a distance here, watching the news, how much flooding uh, there is in in many many important areas. And uh, as I say, that's uh, 
you and I agree, this is a it's an excellent uh, educational opportunity to to watch a, a, not a movie uh, about you know a fictional uh, fantasy, but a an actual real time uh, urban scale disaster. Real time simulation, basically. Well, the, yeah, in terms of you know the the, we, the cost involved for families to uproot and, and have to to have enough supplies for their families on the road and the cost of being on the road and all to organize for that and to be able to handle that. We're you know, not ready, I mean? John. America is not ready for a disaster. That's what I took took away from this experience. Well, so so you you're downvoting the you're downvoting the the disaster response on a number of fronts on the government front, but also in terms of the public's capacity yes. to handle it. Correct. Uh, well, this is this is very challenging. I mean, America in some ways is such a prepared nation, but perhaps we find that uh, you know we're not as prepared in, yeah, in some, some other important ways that we need to be. There's some holes in our games, as they say in the sports world. <laughs> you know, and it's it's very true, John. And of course, we you mentioned the UFOs and all this sort of thing. And I'm sure you've been keeping up with all the latest info. And one of the most recent thing was a new rendering of the infamous jellyfish UFO, by the way. It, I'm not sure if you saw that, but that is probably one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. I have I have seen the jellyfish UFO uh, that the the image I, I I think this is from the Middle East or Iraq or Afghanistan uh, I believe Af Afghanistan and so this this uh, military sourced image as I recall of this seemingly uh, yeah like a disc with tendrils descending below Correct. and uh, it's it's a, it's a very popular story I, I I've looked at it and I can't I I don't know how to make more sense out of it I was looking for like if it was, let's say, uh, limbs. If it, let's say, hypothetically, it was an octopus just out of waters, in a flying octopus, so to speak. Well, then the the wind pressure from its forward motion would cause the tendrils to trail off and do different things in the in the turbulence. And I, so I was watching for that, and I, I was thinking, well, maybe those apparent apparent tendrils are made out of a hard substance because they didn't appear to move a lot when it seemed to me that it was traveling at some level, amount of speed. That there would be wind turbulence, and and a uh, that 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 the uh, the pressure of the wind would would push the tendrils back at least at their at the at their tips that you would you would be able to detect the turbulence the the activity like a flag they would flap right and you're referring to actually the Jeremy Corbell and Knapp uh, footage that they released but actually I'm referring to this other image that came out which is extremely clear, and I'm sending you that photo right now uh, through okay, Skype. Okay, I, I better get caught up here. On you got to see this. This is this one is even creepier than you can imagine. This looks oh, very, very mechanical looking. Yeah, and so now we're in an era when uh, we, we, we question the role of uh, CGI and AI in, um, in digital image uh, creation. It certainly is a, an intensely um, detailed... Uh, image, that's particularly the the form on the right hand uh, frame. Right. Uh, you know, so there's particular a uh, high level of detail, uh, which I think is of great interest. I don't know what type of photographer was involved, but they, but the the tips of the tendrils and the globe itself both appear in good focus. There's sharp focus on the reflection, which appears to show some kind of a like a mountain or some kind of a triangle form. Uh, so, so this is excellent. There's really excellent uh, photographic characteristics, and I, I, I wonder if it's just a little too excellent. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I was thinking about that. Perhaps AI, as you mentioned, but they uh, nicknamed this thing the Afghanistan Reaper. I love <laughs> well, it that. Sounds, it sounds very scary, man. It, it does. Very scary. And I, is there is there motion video that you've seen of it as well? I have not seen uh, this one in question. This was just a photograph, but I believe it's uh, still from uh, the Jeremy Corbell footage. Well, okay, so Jeremy Corbell, let's say, let's say, uh, is is a controversial figure. Exactly. Yes. As a presenter, and and there's reasons to question that you know the qualitative nature of of many of his submissions, although they are wildly popular. And they continue to have uh, levity in, in in international media. There's there these are rep, these are media touchstones. Every time they talk about UAPs, they flash these out of focus, low resolution thermal imager. <laughs> Could be anything. Shots and then right. they say it's definitely aliens. And I'm going like, wow, it's you know, it's it's from a from a let's say uh, you know a student of cinematography, UFO cinematography. It's very disappointing 
when I when I can go to uh, civilian level public submissions of much superior and much more intriguing and much more informative images. Uh, we and we know we know from the civilian side that the military also has these. In fact, now the latest conspiracy theory whistleblower is saying that there's a, a a government program at the Pentagon. There's a program at the Pentagon yes. that is securing all of the the greatest and best media that has ever been collected of the UFOs. Is they're sequestering it away. They're doing and, that, and they're doing photo brushing is another tactic. There's a whole team they have out there that are doing these sort of things. Well, so airbrushing and other media techniques are longstanding tools, uh, masking. Uh, go back to particularly for people who, stu- who were students of wartime media in the Second World War. Uh, the, these kinds of instruments were continuously used because of the intense pressure to politicize uh, fa- the facts of the day. And so uh, their development, uh, in fact, there was a, a, a well-known and perhaps pseudo-notorious a film studio in uh, in Los Angeles that was in fact a a military installation, and it was used in the production of uh, these types of either either it was for the production of the nuclear test films or other kinds of agency level type of uh, film uh, development or production, uh, and it was featured in, it was it was even used in a feature film about extraterrestrials. In the early 1980s, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the studio, but again, it was in this film, and it it says again that the uh, this the, the 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 cinema and the media stagecraft and statecraft is only one letter of difference, mm. and, and and so the you know the, the powerful media tools, particularly uh, you know a a, a, a a large and you know huge hugely wealthy country like the United States, can have these powerful media tools. And uh, those are those are definitely, you know, for the for the for the uninitiated, those are in many cases they're instruments of of the state. I love that. And just to set the record straight, just so we know where you stand on this issue, do you believe that these things are real and not just a, a drone of sorts, a, a sort of vehicle that uh, is under wraps by our air force? Well, I, 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 I have this terrible joke that I tell about it's the potential for <laughs> military uh, soldiers to, you know, well, they, they, they were up on the uh, secret base where the project is being kept under wraps and uh, they go up to the, uh, the supervisor, hey, Sarge, uh, how about we take uh, the secret project out for a, a spin, promise to have it back by midnight. <laughs> it's very it's very unlikely that they would be flying expensive secret projects over wide highly populated areas with a high likelihood uh, likelihood of recordings right it's extremely unlikely that that would ever any security protocol would ever support that it's just not, uh, yeah, it's just with you on that yes it's illogical yeah i'm with you on that 100 percent. and you know it's almost as as a wild and silly as our friend Mr. What's his name? I'm I'm already forgetting his name. I was just had on the tip of my tongue here. He also he wrote the book. Oh, Whitney Whitney um, Strieber. Mm-hmm. You know he wrote the book Communion up in a cabin, and he I had a friend of mine who was who was sort of a I guess you could say they were getting quite close to each other, and he explained how during the book Communion, uh, the cabin that he had up in the woods, his friends would come over and they would uh, take rides. Uh, here and there to anywhere they basically wanted on a UFO. <laughs> so in other words, it was a Uber of sorts. Well, I imagine what they were saving on airfare. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is why... <laughs> uh, it's, he, I, you know, I heard that and I, I told my friend, I said, you know, I like, I like him. I like Mr. Strieber, but some of the things he talks about and believes are a little far-fetched. I think they're quite embellished, I would say. Well, I, I, in this field and, and many others, I encourage direct experience, and I, I, I talk about how accessible um, new and innovative experiences can be in the, in our world. It's more; these things are more accessible than our culture might uh, uh, want us to believe. And in fact, we don't get a lot of, in my experience, we don't get a lot of public education growing up about the potential for seeing something unusual or experiencing something unusual. 
uh, in, in particularly in regions where it's very likely that the population will, will have some kind of mysterious encounter, they'd be better served with educational resources to prepare them than people, a culture that, you know, fomenting ignorance uh, or worse is uh, oppressing the people who are trying to understand their experiences. <laughs> I want to believe, as the meme suggests. Uh, I'm all in, by the way. I, I love this subject. I've been very much into it since I was a child. And uh, through all the years now, it's you see all these sort of figures embellish a lot of their stories. And it's a little, it's uh, I guess you could say it's, it's a little heartbreaking that some people would go to this, uh, these great heights to sort of uh, fool the, the general public and um, grift as you, as another good way of putting it. It's, it's well, the, crazy to see the, the grifters out there in this field. Well, there's become a, a, a more and more open culture of criticism in the alternative commu community against perceived ethical or legal breaches of conduct. Uh, there have been uh, major controversies surrounding lawsuits against uh, producers and directors at Gaia oh, yes. over over stars with Corey they, Good, you know, yes, and David Wilcock. They, people, people who they you know put on the map, so to speak. Yeah, uh, huge explosive dramas, and, and I, I I I don't know that any of those laws. Although I read I read with great interest the history of them. At this point, I don't even know if, if any of them. <laughs> have come to any kind of settlement or, you know, decisions. Well, they all sued each other, basically. Just an incredibly expensive and destructive <laughs> Pretty um, much. meltdown. Yeah, and like it's, it's almost like the, it's like a Mexican standoff. <laughs> excuse, excuse the uh, the term, but it, it, the last no, that's, man that's standing. Accurate, yeah. The last man standing is what is what we're watching, appear to be watching play out. And I say that the you know, level of vindictiveness is intense, although people may be feel, have feelings that their livelihoods are being tampered with in some ways. I, at the same time, I recognize that perhaps there are many uh, people amongst those, those uh, involved in these dramas who are less than willing to uh, accept any sort of adult level of responsibility for their own conduct and, and its role in, in fomenting the problems <laughs> that, that have come up. I, I haven't seen a lot of that mea culpa type of uh, reflection and it doesn't give me a lot of confidence in players who aren't able to to manifest a little bit of that I especially for folks who are especially for folks who are posing as educators in uh you know personal development or consciousness yes uh, it's, it's it's very disheartening and i acquiesce with all your points here and i was just going to quickly mention you know we talked about dolphins and we talked about the acid being administered and these were experiments with uh with also telepathy basically and as you know there's Many of cases where people think they are talking to uh, this this entity through the use of telepathy, and I believe Jung also wrote that telepathy undoubtedly existed. Freud, on the other hand, I don't think he really personally believed in it too much. Yes, well, they, they, the, the, these, these major figures in the early days of psychoanalysis uh, held a variety of perspectives. Some of them were very innovative, and some some of them faced uh, incarceration over their their medical practices uh i think that uh well i i think that that uh jung jung saw saw much more uh support and grace embracing in the 1950s 1960s right 1970s later generations uh, had appealed to what, what although he was a contemporary of freud he he had particular appeal to later generations and i guess people have to pass through different types of experiences people were not we're not satisfied with psychoanalysis, and there are psychiatrists who retire early because they're not satisfied with the outcomes, and they move on to other things. And so it's a school of thought, and uh, it is, you know, it, it certainly has played a major role. But it is, uh, it, it's, 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 it's only, it, it only exists now as one type of offering. Uh, I think there's many caring people, caring and well educated, and uh, people of good character working in, in, as psychiatrists. However, psychiatry is also is also condemned in, in the MK Ultra experiments as a, as a party, just as, as the psychologists are for accepting millions of dollars to teach uh, how people how to torture down in uh, Abu Ghraib. <laughs> yes, in Abu Ghraib. And uh, yes, uh, all the, I'm sure people are probably wondering, well, how does this all tie in uh, to reverse speech and what we're talking about? And uh, it certainly does. You know, this is tapping into the unconscious unconscious mind basically the unconscious the, mind the collective well, yes unconscious 
I think I think because in, you know I I believe that the mind in, in ways in mysterious ways that we not may not entirely understand manifests our our experiences, and so it's what's flowing from within us is is what we are actually, we're living through, and the, the, this dynamic if we if we if we understand it and learn how to it's like a machine, you know, if we learn how to ride it then it'll take us far. Uh, otherwise, we may find ourselves, you know, continuously struggling with the waves crashing down upon us instead of us surfing on the top. Love that. And uh, yes, I believe now it's a great segue to uh, play some of the audio you got for us, my friend. Yes, well, we're going to go into some forbidden zones here. I, I guess I, I've, I've come to some sort of conclusion that I, I tend to, you know, play some of the more controversial materials of the day. And yet I think these are important discussions and I'm a great believer in bitter pilling which means that you know we're willing to tackle difficult topics because there's more juice that will come out of us oh, and yes. we will we'll develop character and become stronger people through exposure to different uh, high intensity issues of our times. And so although this is forbidden on Reddit apparently, that's the news of the day, we're gonna <laughs> talk about the attempted assassination of former US President Trump Here we go. in Butler, Pennsylvania from July 13th, as well as some of the aftermath audio well, I, uh, there's significant media that's available about, about the events of the day as well as, all, as the aftermath. I mean, there's a huge amount of media that was developed. But I, I, this, what I'm going to show on today's episode is uh, my early look at some of the, you know, the key players of the Times, including the former president himself. So if we could start with President Trump at the rally speech uh, where the shots were fired. And uh, it seems to me that just in the moments before uh, the shots erupted that the president had some sort of uh, foresight. But if we study the, the history of the president's speeches, I, I was I was carrying reports on earlier episodes of the show, uh, even in the last year, about President Trump of uh, fears of, of uh, I, I said it in, the, in a previous episode, he was afraid of a female character assassin. Did I not? I believe you and did, so, actually. Yes, I... I remember we uh, we played that audio and you were saying, well, I hope this doesn't happen. I sure hope it wasn't, you know, going the other way. But <laughs> I, I, at the time, I would say I was willing to entertain it as sort of a literary situation, but it seems now things are much more serious, of course. Uh, well, and so uh, Oy vey. The, the, the president, uh, the former president has um, has has endured uh, you know, so, some difficulty, in other words, because he was he had fears of risks of exposure in public events in his political career. And I think it's been reported that going in the way back, he had been using the same kind of language, fear of fear, of, uh, fear of violence, being being subject to violence due to his political stance. So that's quite a lot for anyone to have to, to live with. Nevertheless, I, I feel that even in the moments leading up to the shooting that the president had some feeling about this, I heard the words well, uh, we'll play, let's play the, the segment first. We'll hear the president's rally speech. Our country's, been, our country's been stolen from us. You see that? It's the greatest, one of the greatest crimes is what they've done over four years and hiding what the obvious facts are, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it a shame? You run, for, you run for the president of the United States from a basement, from a basement. All... Very dishonest stuff, but you know, Erfnery. 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 Well, I can hear that. Yeah, it seemed that, you know, this is a well developed thread in, in the mind of the former president. And it was also, it, apparently, by the sequence of events, it, it, it was it forecast what was happening in the next few minutes. Let's play that one more time. Our country's been, our country's been stolen from us. You see that? It's the greatest, one of the greatest crimes is what they've done over four years and hiding what the obvious facts are, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it a shame? You run for... You run for the president of the United States from a basement, from a basement. All very dishonest stuff, but you know, Erfnery. 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 
Yes, it's a very interesting clip there. These bizarre patterns of uh, somewhat coincidence, the fact that um, he got shot at. It also, how, how it's sort of semi-Shakespearean, uh, you know, he's the contemplation of death. We capture, we capture the former president contemplating a violent ending. Of course, we know these, he's, he's almost, he survived almost unscathed. He's, apparently his injury, his ear industry has uh, recovered very well. Uh, and so, uh, you know, any, anyone's fear of his injury, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's behind, that, that's, that's behind him. He, he was not injured, although we, we st understand he's still at peril for further attacks. And there have been at least two uh, suspected uh, attempts, uh, one with a rifle and one with explosives, uh, since this uh, event in Butler. So it's been very a very difficult year, to say the least, uh, just for the president uh, to you know, stay alive and healthy. Uh, former president, excuse me, while he campaigns, uh, and uh, I, I uh, as a as an, a watcher of American history, I recognized how closely this uh, this meshed with the history of assassinations against leading political figures in the United States, and uh, I, I I read uh, continuously of the suspicions uh, that uh, many people have held about failure of operations, uh, including at the Secret Service level. And do you believe this would be a "quote unquote" conspiracy theory? Well, you know, we're we're looking now, you know, back with twenty twenty hindsight at something that happened in real time uh, and a present time moment. It's in fact, in fact, it's so fresh that it's it's an opportune time to 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 study the topic while you know while the players are still in town before everyone flees. You see, <laughs> so it's not a cold trail; it's a hot trail. Uh, at least you know, in July, it certainly was hot. Um, so in those moments is perhaps the most opportune time to capture uh, data before uh, everything evaporates due to different, you know, malfeasance or uh, um, misappropriation. Right. Or, and, you know, they caught that other guy as well, that uh, other the, gentleman the, the, who was going out there. The golf course rifle. Correct. Yes. And so I followed that story and very interesting uh, individual history uh, as including uh, time served in Ukraine as a member of the Foreign Legion. And so uh, it implicated him in uh, defense intelligence or CIA intelligence, militia level intelligence operations overseas. Uh, so, somehow uh, he was working actively as a recruiter and that was captured in a, a news or documentary interview that's published online, it's easy to find. Uh, so it, it, it raises people's hackles about it, some kind of inside uh, experience, it, it, it kind of a conspiracy within government State act, uh, state actors are acting with state powers against the f individual, like the former president. It raises people's suspicions about that, just as people are suspicious about the role of the CIA in the assassination of uh, the Kennedys. Yes, another strange case of coincidence. Both the shooters, the one you just mentioned, and the one who actually took a shot, both were featured in a Black Rock commercial. By the way, both in a Black Rock commercial, and the I, same I one, yeah. I think the dullest among us still find that intriguing, quite frankly. I mean, what's, what are the odds? <laughs> it's very unusual, that's for sure, to say the very least. And I believe we do have a, another one here. This is of, uh, who's this, uh, Joe Biden, a response speech, you say. All right, so this is the early response, the first response of current President Biden uh, to the events and I, uh, so I captured him in this in this uh, broadcast. Uh, the messages uh, talked about uh, death. It talked about endings, and it also talked about violence. Uh, I it really I really was uh, moved by the the high energized President Biden appeared to be in his in his speech in his unconscious speech. I heard the messages: uh, "Your kiss of death, gotta pull the pin or you lose." And I'm going to shoot at a liar. And remember, folks, this is still at a time when President Biden was a viable candidate for the 2024 election uh, before he left the, the campaign. So with the, that's part, you know, that's that's where we catch him now. He's still actively campaigning, trying to win a, an election. Let's hear. Let's hear the clip. Here we go. I want to thank the Secret Service and all the agencies, including the state agencies that have been engaged in making sure that the people who, and we have more detail to come relative to other injured, other people maybe injured in the audience. I don't have all that detail. We'll make that available to you. I may be able to come back a little later tonight, but we'll put out a statement if we don't, if I'm not able to get, if, we're, if it's not convenient for you all. But the bottom line is 
The, the Trump rally was a rally that he should have been able to can be conducted peacefully and without any problem. I can hear that one. It's I can hear the very ending of it, but the beginning a little difficult. Well, it, it may well be. This, these are my interpretations, uh, it, and uh, this is lengthy audio. Uh, the, the, you know, upon further examination, there may be only limited parts of that that are viable inform as information. But the themes I'd like to talk about here is simply that uh, uh, it it seems that the 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 stench of death is is on the minds of many. Right. Although no, uh, the the death was of a firefighter, a family person, uh, not of a political figure. Uh, furthermore, uh, pulling the pin, you know, sometimes that's that's like a, a metaphor for uh, operating a, a grenade. Ah, yes. Just something explosive, a weapon, but also it's it's kind of some kind of a terminal decision. Uh, and so, of course, we know that the uh, the president ended his candidacy uh, within a short period of time after the events of Butler. So I wonder if he if he's here thinking about ending the candidacy as one example, but it also has an aura of violence around it, as I say, like an, something explosive. And furthermore, uh, continuing the theme of violence about shooting, uh, as if you know, uh, you know, one of the most rudimental conspiracy theories is that President Biden had some role in, in in attempting to assassinate former President Trump. And I'm wondering, well, you know, is he going to disclose that? But here, at least metaphorically, you know, the the, the thought of, appears to cross his mind. But he, but more for, furthermore, he appears to accuse the former president of dishonesty or dissembling or making stuff up. He uses the word liar. And so I wonder if he's, you know, his characterization of a deep resentment towards President Trump. And I wonder further if those deep resentments are coloring his statements, you know, perhaps amplifying strong feelings, less so than really implicating. Sometimes people talk a big game. Right. But they're not actually going to do anything. Yeah. And so I, so I wonder if, I wonder in other words, if President Biden's Irish American temper is coming out in, in this, uh, but it's, it's not really a strong indicator necessarily that he's a man of action or how closely, what his proximity is to the events of the, of the shooting. I believe his feelings have changed completely, though. We, we see a very different Joe Biden now that he's kind of um, been removed forcefully. Uh, I don't think he is a big fan of Kamala nor the, the people that were backing him. Uh, well, I, I understand that uh, he's gone rogue at, at some public uh, press events and, and been subversive towards uh, candidate Harris. Uh, I, I didn't follow the particulars of it, but uh, yeah, there's there's definitely some dissent, and uh, you know I think one of the great criticisms of American government is is the the durations of the terms of the politicians, and that uh, it's to the disadvantage of their their vigorous youthful generations are not able to. Uh...